All right. To begin with, we're going to have to understand what energy is because nobody tells you. They just tell you uh, uh, this has so many uh, uh, calories or this has so many uh, net therms or this has so many uh, sugar bricks levels. But none of that really means anything unless you know how to use it. So, get all my things organized. When you look at biological energy, what you're looking at is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. A carbohydrate. Sugars, starches, fats, waxes, cellulose, hemicellulose, all of these are just carbohydrates, nothing else. Carbon supplies 9,000 calories per gram. Yes? Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> you might have to just come right up here. That's fine with me, too. You might see if we can get black. I'll get them all out. All right. Carbon supplies 9,000 calories per gram, but carbon doesn't burn. If you wish to try to burn some pure carbon, take your wife's diamond ring and your acetylene torch. If you live, you'll find out it didn't do anything. All right, they put it on drill bits for drilling for oil and other things through hard ground. Hydrogen supplies 25,000 calories per gram. You have to have hydrogen hooked to carbon to be able to burn or utilize the carbon. Okay, oxygen, you can't have all positives. Oxygen is a negative... 3,125 calories per gram. Okay? And we have that. <coughs> All right. Now, as an example, so that you understand this, let's take some methane and add some oxygen and a spark, and you yield carbon dioxide and water and some work or heat released. This is the, this happens in a gasoline engine. This happens in the cell of the body. So it might happen a little slower in the body, but nonetheless, this is what happens. You burn a carbohydrate and now when you're doing this, you need to balance this ration. You need to set the carburetor on the cow or on the car. So what does that mean? It means I have to balance these so I get a, a, a good reaction. This reaction doesn't have enough oxygen over here. You see I only have two here and I have two, one, I have three. So I need some more. Well, I'll just add some more oxygen. And uh, now I've got a balanced reaction. So, I calculated this out so that you could see what has actually happened. Since carbon weighs 12, the atomic weight of carbon is 12, and we have one, so that means 9,000 calories times 12, because we only have one carbon, that's 108,000 calories. Okay, I have four hydrogens. Hydrogen weighs one, and I got 25,000 calories for each one of them. So that means I have 100,000 calories. So I add those two together, and I got 208. But I have four oxygens. Oxygen weighs 16. 
So a minus 3,125 calories times 16 times 4 is 64. And I get two, a negative 200,000 calories. And I had 208 over here, so that means I get this heat thing here, or energy produced, means I got a plus 8,000 calories. That's how it's done. Now, it's a little more complicated with an animal than it is, uh, it is uh, on a chemistry sheet here like this. But nonetheless, this is how it's done. So what we're trying to do is make energy, okay? That's the biggest problem is with our with our uh, with all animals is energy. It's not protein or minerals. That's those are minor. It's energy. So I'm going to erase this. You understand what energy is now? It's calories produced by the burning or utilization of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, I'll try to make this dark with this green. This is a green grass plant, legume, I don't care, a green plant. All right, now what we're trying to do with this grass plant is is make energy. So how are we going to make energy? Well, here's the sun. All of you made this in the fifth grade. Oh, thanks. Remember in the fifth grade you made the sun like this and you made grass? Remember that? I'm sure you do. All right. And then we took, uh, the plant took in some water down here now remember you put out fires with water so it's not a source of energy you know that right wait a minute you could prove that I get all these undone here hydrogen 25,000 we got two hydrogens two times 25 is 50,000 calories and uh, one oxygen the 16 times uh, minus 3125 if you calculate it out you'll find it's a negative 50,000 that's why water doesn't have any energy it's net neutral it takes a lot of energy to break that bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. It takes more than what you're going to get out of it. So water is not something that's going to give you energy. Unless, unless you have this thing. You have a green plant. Now you know photosynthesis. Well, what, where does it get its carbon from? Well, all the carbon comes from right here. Now, CO2, you put out fires with it, right? It doesn't supply any energy either. But with photosynthesis, this green plant will take in carbon dioxide through pores in the plant underneath the leaf called stomata. And it takes it in there, and then it takes the water up here and then with the sunlight and actually some mineral elements like iron and magnesium and several other mineral elements, because you have to have those also, it converts this carbon dioxide and water to sugar. So we got some, uh, some glucose here. So the water comes up here, and the hydrogen comes off, and the oxygen goes out here into the air for us to breathe. 
Now, I've got a plan. This is the only joke you'll hear. It's not even a joke. It's something I believe can happen. We've been put a big dome over Washington, D.C., and New York, and Chicago, and we will make them pay us to take their carbon dioxide. And then we will bill them for the oxygen that we're going to let them breathe. This is not a joke. This is a possibility. Did you know that the amount of carbon dioxide out here in the country is actually deficient from what you actually could produce in grass? You didn't know that, did you? Scientific fact. It was, the research was done in Germany, where there's a few more people, and they all live in the city. And you could actually double the amount of production, actually a little more, uh, uh, what, of what you produce if you could just supply some more carbon dioxide that everybody's trying to tell you kills you. By the way, without carbon dioxide, this plant dies. So to tell you that carbon dioxide is a bad thing, uh, ask them if they like to eat and ask them if they like to breathe air. All right. So here's the relationship. Now, yes, you have to have carbon dioxide. Yes, you have to have water. Yes, you have to have sunlight. And yes, you have to have the green plant. And yes, you have to have some minerals in there, certain elements to help the photosynthetic synthetic process. Okay. Oh, by the way, if you have questions as I'm going, just raise your hand and I'll, because sometimes I go off on a, tangent that's not what you're wanting to know about. All right. Uh, happens all the time. Uh, yes? I mean, what is the sun getting? Oh, electrons. <laughs> Without that, you, there is no energy. <laughs> that that uh, electrons are coming down and breaking this bond between right there. Well, it doesn't do it here. It does it up here. And this will show you uh, uh, this. You could test this, and you'll find uh, the glucose levels or sugar bricks levels in the plant. But it didn't come from just carbon dioxide. You had to have the water so that the oxygen is released and the hydrogen is combined with the carbon dioxide to make, you know, uh, uh, a carbohydrate. Carbon, hydrogen, well, they're all a little different. Okay. So it's from... Electrons from the sun. All right, so what happens at nighttime? Does the energy, does this continue to happen? No. You have to have these electrons. Will the plant still grow? Yes, uh, but not nearly as fast, and it won't produce this. It'll start respiring rather than photosynthesizing. So it actually loses energy at night. Well, what happens if you have cloudy weather? Reduced photosynthesis. Reduced energy produced in the plant. How about if we have a, a drought period? Well, without water, you have no hydrogen. Without hydrogen, you can't make a carbohydrate. So it's real important that everything be in the right proportion. Well, it never is. Thing changes constantly. Okay. I'm going to go on now. Uh, did I answer your question? Well, you knew that. You, you already knew that. Yes, sir. Right. 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 In, in, that, in that reaction... This methane, it doesn't have to be methane. I just use it because it's easy. 
and water, whoop, methane plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water and heat or work done. This is the politician using up our oxygen and giving us a waste material that he's going to pay us to take from him. Do you see? So this is, this is just showing you what energy is. This is showing you how to make it. Okay? So here I made some sugars and starches, and, and I made some oxygen, and I'm going to sell that to them politicians, and they're going to utilize it, and they're going to produce that product, and we're going to take that product and start over again. Did you understand? Sorry, I, I, I kind of got the horse before the cart, I guess. <clears throat> the person who's growing the plant ought to be the main guy because he's producing something that those guys have to have to live. They have to have food. So we're going to give them some sugar cookies, and uh, they have to have some oxygen, so we're going to sell them the oxygen. See, we're going to sell them everything. Then we're going to charge them to take their waste. It's not a joke. It's a possibility. I would love to know them anyway. All right. <clears throat> so we need to maximize this growth of this plant to produce our sugars and starches and fats and proteins and, and uh, to maybe feed it to a cow or a horse or a sheep or even if it's not fed to an animal, maybe you're going to produce some vegetables. People do like vegetables occasionally. Uh, I've had one one time this week. But what you have to understand about this plant is, is, uh, is it has to have certain requirements that maybe we can or cannot give it. All right. Also, this plant is going to make some proteins. Well, what's a protein? This is Mark's protein for you chemists out there. Carbon, hydrogen, This is my amino acid. Yeah, I know they're all different than that and all different structures, but we're just keeping it simple. This is a carbohydrate. You can see it, carbohydrate. Now, it's a protein. The only difference between a carbohydrate and a protein is an amine group. That's it, okay? <clears throat> and you need to remember that. I'll talk more about that uh, this afternoon. But you know you have to have some proteins in this plant also. Well, where does those proteins come from? Well, the air is 78% oxygen. Does the nitrogen go into the plant this way? No. If it did, fertilizer would never work because you'd have all the nitrogen you need. So it can't go in this way. It must be... I hate this, but called fixed in the soil in a form that the plant can take up. All right. So it can be taken up maybe as a, a nitrate, you know, three. Okay. Or maybe it's a small amino acid or maybe even some ammonia, an NH2 hooked onto something. And this is how it's taken up by the plant. Now, most of the nitrogen taken up by the plant is controlled by potassium. So you have to have the element potassium to transport nitrogen up into the plant. Without potassium, it doesn't happen. This is why if you're wanting really high protein alfalfa that you want to sell to somebody, you put on a lot of potash, then you get high, high protein levels in your 
in your plants, okay? You can harvest them early and, and hopefully the nitrate gets changed to a protein. What happens? What happens if it's nighttime and you go out there and cut your alfalfa or grass? It doesn't matter what it is. Or, or turnips or uh, spinach for you to eat or lettuce. And, and you put on the potash and it's got some nitrogen out there. And then you get nighttime or cloudy weather. What happens to that nitrogen? Does it get converted to an amino acid or a protein? No, it stays as a nitrate. Well, what's wrong with nitrate? I heard now that dietary nitrates are a real big deal. Dietary nitrates are poison. Didn't you ever heard of blue baby disease? Where if, if a child gets too much uh, nitrates, they, they can't absorb oxygen in their blood and they, they turn blue? Well, that's what it is. Nitrates is not a desirable thing to have in your plant material for your use or an animal's use because it takes a lot of carbon and hydrogen to convert it to an amino acid. Okay, do we understand about nitrates? Ah, no, it's, it, it, every, very good. Every day, every day this plant is taking nitrogen up into here. All right, and so at nighttime or cloudy weather or a drought where we don't have any water, this plant still has this nitrate coming up in here, and it'll be higher in the bottom part of the plant down here because that's where the photosynthesis mostly occurs up here or a higher amount. So the, the nitrogen or the protein that you have down here that you could test is not a true protein. It'll be a nitrate. And if we don't have any... Uh, photosynthesis going on this cannot be converted to a protein so it just stays there doesn't do anything till you go along and harvest it and then it's a problem uh, you can test celery any if, if you all have eaten some celery and some of your celery is bitter tasting and some of it is sweet tasting the bitter is nitrate you can take, you can make yourself a nitrate test kit, and what you use is a, a reagent grade sulfuric acid, about uh, about 450 milliliters, and then get some diphenylamine, and about 15 grams, and pour it in there, and uh, let it dissolve. It takes a little while. Then you could take a few drops of that and put it in a in a glass bowl of course and then take that celery and dip it in there and it'll turn purple it, which means it's very high in nitrates very high uh, the worst one is chewing tobacco the next worst one is cigarettes uh, the least there is no nitrates in fine premium cigars so uh, just so you know uh, uh, spinach can have huge amounts of nitrates. Nitrates are strong oxidizing agents. It means they they can uh, burn the cells. It's not a desirable thing to have in too much in your diet. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so so everything needs to be kind of in proportion. Well, did you know out here? in the soil that there are uh, all kinds of bacteria and protozoa and worms and, and all kinds of critters out here and nobody deals with them. For some reason, uh, we think of the plant by itself and, and the biology, biology of, the, uh, of the soil, uh, they don't associate with, with each other. You know, I guess it's getting to be more where they're thinking that's good. But there is a bacterium 
that live, and there's about 100 species of them, of one that uh, called Azotobacter, A-Z-O-T-O, -O, Azotobacter. This particular organism gets all its nitrogen to make amino acids from the air. Imagine that. From the air. You don't have to fertilize. You just have to feed these guys. Now, there's more than one that, that fixes nitrogen from the air, and they're not associated with these uh, legumes or other grass plants. They're not associated with them at all. They don't make nodules. They don't do anything. They just live over here by themselves. And all you have to do to get all the nitrogen you require is feed them. Well, what does an azotobacter eat? The exact same thing a cow eats, or a sheep, or a goat, or a vegetarian, I don't know, whatever. They eat green plants. Well, do you know anybody that allows any of this green to feed these organisms down here? No. What you guys do is you go down there and you harvest it all. And then it grows back and you harvest it again. And then you go back and you harvest it again. And then after you've done the harvesting, you turn some cows out there to eat the rest of it. So what do we have here? Nothing. Now, what you have to understand about, about Azotobacter and many other organisms in the soil is sunlight kills them. They don't like ultraviolet lights. So you're harvesting everything and you're leaving some open soil. All right, you make corn or you harvest everything off it and you plow it. What did you do? You nuked the desirable organisms in the soil. Well, that wasn't a very good idea. Well, that's just the way it is. Cover crops would help. But still, at some point, you harvested everything off there and you got sunlight down in there. What else do those guys need to grow and multiply and fix nitrogen in the soil? Moisture. Bacteria don't have legs. They have to swim everywhere. All right, so if we don't have, if we've uh, harvested in whatever way a lot of this green material, now we have it open for drying out. So we don't have the moisture, so they can't swim around and get what they want to eat. All right, so we don't have any moisture, we're nuking them. What other thing do we need? Well, these are aerobic organisms. That means they need some oxygen. So if we go down and pound the soil good enough, we shut off oxygen supply. And we don't have worms and, and nematodes and all those other critters in there to break up the soil to get oxygen down into the, where, the, where that organism lives. See? So we've done everything we can to kill them. Just done an excellent job. What else? But those organisms are always there. They're in a protein layer. What happens if they don't have enough of something to grow? All bacteria do this. They'll put a little protein layer around them, and they'll just sit there and wait until conditions are right for it to start growing and multiplying. We could go out here and dig down and get some anthrax if you want and make the conditions right, and we could get it to grow. Just right out here. So, you, you know... They're always there. That's why we got all these new bugs showing up all the time. We're finally making conditions right for them to grow and multiply. All right, so we also have to have the correct pH for that organism to grow. Well, what should that pH be? Well, probably, probably about neutral, 6.5 to 7, 7 to, something like that. So if your soils are very acid, if they're in the five range, it's probably not going to grow. So all of those things have to do with growing the right culture down here to promote this thing. They're all related. Oh, by the way, uh, these guys in, in digesting these foods 
one of their waste materials is carbon dioxide. So you do produce some out there anyway. All right. A any questions? Yes, sir? Yes. Uh, fun fungi, fungi uh, eat dead stuff. And bacteria like green stuff or growing stuff. And you need to have the proper proportion of bacteria to fungus to grow the plants that you wish to grow. If you wish to have just grass, then you might have a total bacterial environment. If you want tomatoes, you'll probably have to have a relationship of about half and half. If you want nothing but forest, then it's totally fungal. And you can move that any direction that you want, that fungal bacterial relationship, by what you feed in the soil. So if you've got a forest and you want some grass in there, you're going to have to take some green stuff, hay, and put in that environment to get them to, uh, to feed those organisms. And you'll probably have to uh, put a starter culture of bacteria in there too. In other words, manure is lots of bacteria. So that's a nice way to start it. So that's what you're going to have to do. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, I forget. Ingham is her last name. Uh, she's uh, 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 Elaine. Elaine Ingham. Uh, on a look under soil food web. She has the relationship of those bacteria to fungi that you would like to have for whatever types of plants that you wish. Very good source to get to. Okay. So re remember, if you're dealing with alfalfa, they're going to want a little more fungal than bacterial. So depending on what it is you're trying to grow and what you're trying to feed is where you need to be. Look it up. Thanks. I, c I couldn't remember her first name. She knows a lot of stuff. <coughs> this isn't where I got it from. I actually ran into this somewhere. I don't know. Reading a book. Okay. <coughs> uh, I, lo I lost track. Any other questions? Yeah. No, no go ahead. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, to use that uh, azotobacter for a seed treatment, uh, yes, you could do it. Yes, you have to keep it out of the sunlight. But once it gets there, what is it going to get fed? You know, that's the problem with adding bacteria to the soils and adding bacteria. They help for just a little bit, but there's no food for them. Nobody fed them. So, it's, you know, I don't know, six of one, half dozen other. If you're going to put down some cover crop and knock it on the ground, no problem. But if you're not, you're just going to put it on bare soil, just we'll give the money to me and I'll hold it for you. Somebody had a question over here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's why cover crop is a good thing. Only trouble is, uh, you put the cover crop down, then what are you going to do? You're going <laughs> to plow it under? Well, you fed the bacteria down, but the ones that you turned over to the sunlight all got nuked. Uh, I, I'm just, it's just the way it is. I, I'm not saying you can't do something. I'm just saying it's not going to be as effective as if you never, ever plowed. So...
Okay. Yes, sir? Oh, what the, <laughs> that's real, that's real simple. What you have is uh, uh, rich fertilizer companies because now you've, well, I, I, uh, because see, you've, you've bypassed the, you've bypassed the use of, of, uh, of the soil microbes and you went to feeding the plant directly. Okay. And, and, uh, and like a, a corn farmer once told me, he said, all I need is something to hold the seed in place. I don't need anything else. Oil and water. Well, uh, so you have no soil life. So go out here and, and check the organic matter in the soil. It's one. It's maybe two if you're lucky, if they actually left the corn stalks on the ground. The pH of the soil, they got to they gotta put a lot of lime on it every year or nothing grows, it's, it's not sustainable. What I mean is, as soon as you run out of money for fertilizer, you're not gonna grow anything. So it's, that's what you get. Yes, sir. It's like the, it's like the song goes, you got the money, honey, I got the time. I know, but that's right. It's it's not sustainable. And also, you need to look at at the end product that you're producing. Yes, sir. Well, no, I just would have probably forgot to go there. <laughs> I, I'm s behind sometimes. Uh, I wanted to finish my thought. Uh, not only, not only are you producing a crop uh, that's not going to be. It's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to have everything you need in it for to sense to sustain life. If you're only dealing with uh, N, P, and K, and some trace elements, finally. I mean, if you remember, it used to be just N, P, and K, and that's all you, 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 you didn't have anything else. But now there are people that are doing the trace elements, finally. Uh, <coughs> but I think the people that forced them to do those trace elements were the people that were feeding it to people or animals, finding these deficiencies, disease symptoms showing up. I think that's why that the research went that direction. I don't, I don't know, but that's what I would guess. So, uh, what they're making now, you know, I have a, a good friend that used to work with me, and he works for Monsanto now. And and he raises chickens, so he called me up and wanted me to do a ration for his chickens. Okay, so I did a ration. And I said, now look, I said if you're using uh, uh, corn now uh, uh, that that we have this uh, available now, uh, you're going to find that the uh, the oxygen level is higher, the hydrogen level is lower, and and that you'll have to adjust on the ration. Now, what that meant was it had less energy. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, and I'll talk a little bit this afternoon about that. And and I said I, I don't I don't know why, but uh, on our analysis, the hydrogen content on corn has gone from 7.1 percent hydrogen down to 6.85. And the and I th and I said I think I also know why the phosphorus level has dropped from 0.37 to about 0.27. 
And the only reason I can figure that happens is because phosphorus got real expensive, so nobody uses it. So therefore, the energy of the plant went down. And I'll explain that if I remember. All right. <coughs> well, I tend to ramble. Uh, okay. <coughs> he says, uh, I know. He says, I know all that. I said, well, then what caused it? He said, we want to produce corn with the most starch. I said, why? Why? He said, because we can make more ethanol with it. He said, we don't want no fat in there because it's too hard to break down. So, so we produce corn with high starch contents so we can be the ethanol state. Okay. Well, if you're going to feed that to a cow, you've got a bit of a problem. Now it's, you're more susceptible to founder and acidosis and all those problems with today's corn than you did in the 60s and the 70s. So it's just the way it is. Uh, uh, okay. A any, did, I <laughs> did I answer your question? I don't even remember what it was. See how I am? So <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, on the C3s. Okay, in the, you're talking about the warm season grasses. Means you started being a vegetarian and not a steak eater. What? God, that's easy to balance that ration. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sorry for you people that like veg. The people who are vegetarians or enjoy those, please be aware of what you're buying. Does this stuff have nitrates in it? It's not good for you. Strong oxidizer. Why, what are everybody trying to sell you antioxidants for? Because you're eating all these high oxygenated feeds. All this nitrate stuff. Be aware. Nobody probably told you. Check for nitrates. Go get some sulfuric acid and diphenylamine and check it. Don't pour it on you. It, it tends to eat your clothes up. Uh, and gets in your, you know, so... Very good. How, yeah, that's exactly right. How are we going to get this green plant down here for this thing to eat? Got any ideas? No, it's not. It's mature. It's mature then. It has to be green. Okay, I'll give you some ideas. There we go. That's the cheapest way. Of course, you, you, you need to support the oil people, so get on your tractor and... Uh, but the cow will come by and stomp right on that thing. Yeah, they'll be right here. But as soon as, 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 soon as you, if you just have one leaf layer there and they eat through it, then they're in the sunlight. And then they get nuked. So you've got to have more than one. You've got to have a layer. And it'll disappear. And what is this when they d break this down and eat it? Organic matter that everybody is worried about. Easy to make it, but you see, everybody thinks if if I don't get it here, harvest it here, I'm wasting. Amish are notorious for saying that. The more you feed the organisms in the soil, the more green plant material you will have. Period. Uh, it's sustainable. It never, never, never goes away. I I can't believe it's that quick already. All right. Any any other questions? I still got to get to the C threes. I'm sorry. All right. We have warm season and cool season grasses. And and by the way, I 
I raise some beef cow. Well, actually, I I take care of the beef cows, and my grandkids own them, which means I do all the work, and they harvest all the money. And and and, uh, and in Wisconsin, I have or had almost all cool season grasses, fescue and timothy and rye grass and so forth. And I don't remember all the names of the grasses, and I really don't care. If a cow eats it, it's a good grass. Uh, other than that, I don't care. And then, uh, uh, but in the summer, in July, they, as you know, fescue uh, uh, produces a fungus that says, don't eat me. I'm not good for you. Because at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, cool season grasses stop photosynthesizing that means that they're not producing any energy you understand they're lower in energy so then a fungus starts growing because now it's not a green plant producing antibodies and all kinds of good stuff to keep uh, fungus and other things from growing you didn't know maybe that they had a, 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 a system of antibodies produced that well they do you know, the higher the sugar levels, no bugs will bother them. The army worms never even go in there if the sugar levels are high. But if they're not, the army worms come in and clean it out. All right. So I wanted to get some warm season grasses, so I got some feed for that period of time when it, the temperature is above 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I didn't have any. And... Uh, so uh, uh, I went and uh, purchased some hay uh, from down in Kentucky, and it happened to be Johnson grass. Oh, my God, we can't have that. That's poisonous. You can't buy seed, by the way, because all the corn people uh, won't, won't allow Johnson grass in their corn. I don't know what they're worried about. They just spray it with Roundup and kills it anyway. But... So I just took some hay up there and I fed it. And now I got some Johnson grass. Well, an interesting thing about that particular species of uh, warm season grass, and it grows real nice. And in the summer, you've got lots of volume and it's, it's a pretty good product. But as soon as it gets a little cool, it's useless and the cows will not eat it. It's not brown yet. It will get brown, but the cows won't eat it because the energy has dropped down and it's cool enough now that the fescue and other plants are starting to grow and their sugar levels are up. So the cows made the decision. I could go out there and test and say, well, this grass is not good because and because and because, but the cow already knew it. So, so what's important is not what the lab test says but what the cow says well, do you understand what I'm saying I'm saying I'm saying you can test that and see that and during the heat of the summer you can go out and see all the carbon that it's sequestering okay but as soon as the temperature changes it'll be the other plants that do it and that one will stop so when did they test it you don't know it was probably in July, the hottest part of the year, hot and humid, and it's going to, the photosynthesis is going to be very high in that plant and very low in the others. You've got to understand about how research is done, you know, and, and they eliminate all the variables, but sometimes they forget a few. I had to deal with it too many times. So, okay, did I, did I, no, I didn't answer that the way you wanted to hear it, <laughs> maybe. But first, I have a lot more questions. What plants did they use? Did they test the others compar comparing the two? And what time of the year? And what temperature? And what moisture? They probably didn't have any rye grass or, or Timothy in those places where they tested it. 
and tested it in the spring. So, what else? Other questions? Yes, sir. Absolutely, positively. He wanted to know, it, it, does it make a difference when you harvest, what time of day you cut or mow your hay? If, if it takes sunlight to get the sugar levels up, when is the sugar levels highest? Here at 6 in the morning or 8 at night? No. It's right here when you don't want to go out because it's too dang hot. About uh, probably 12 to 3 will be the highest levels. Well, uh, let's say three days before that, you had cloudy, rainy weather. Should you rush out there the next day between 12 and 3 and cut it? No. You should wait one more day to get the sugar levels up. You see? You see? You see? I'm just telling you the best. I'm not telling you this is absolute. All right. If you're going to, all right. <laughs> all right, that is the best. And you're, you know, what did you harvest this for? Just because you want to harvest it and sell it to somebody? Okay, you don't care what it is. And the guy that's buying it, I'm sure it don't matter to him. You know, it, it don't matter. But if you're harvesting it for you, is, doesn't this matter? Well, sure it does. Because if the energy is low in this, what happens? The cow is going to eat more to make up for what's not there. So you got, had to pay for it twice. Big mistake. Check the sugar bricks levels. That's a good way to do it. Okay. Now, that's the best. All right. Let's say, uh, uh, you know, everything broke down, and at 4 o'clock you want to, okay, go out and cut it. All right. Now, the next question is, if you're going to cut this hay, what, what should you how should you harvest it? How should you store it? How should, you know, what is it you cut it for? You cut it for energy, right? And maybe protein too, but energy. And as soon as you cut it, and let's say you're in a hurry, so you, uh, you crimp it. Don't ever, ever crimp. Ever. Ever. Because when you crimp it, you broke the seal. And when you break the seal, you get oxidation. And oxidation is the burning of carbon and hydrogen. And you lose what? Energy. And even some protein. You lose some protein also. So did you harvest this just to sell it to the neighbor? Okay, I know. You do whatever you want. But don't crimp if you're saving it for yourself. Also, uh, let's say you, uh, rather than crimping, and you mow it and it's going to rain, stick it in a bag. Traps the energy in there. All right. Let's say you mowed it, it rained, and the next day you're going to go out and harvest it as baleage. If you want it to ferment properly so that it has a sweet smell, so that it actually gets the fermentation process down and brings the pH down to around 4 so that it won't mold, put some sugar with it. That's what you lost. You don't have to put probiotics with it or all that. They're already there. The only thing you need to put with that is some sugar, molasses, I don't care, whatever. Glucose. Probably starch should even work. And it's cheap. And then that will feed the bacteria in the soil or in the, in the silage and bring the pH down and it'll ferment very well. I had a guy that had cut some hay and they 
got ready to bale it, and uh, it, it uh, got rained on two inches. So he went out there, and he tethered it up and aired it out, and they got ready to bale it again, and it rained on it again. So now I uh, tethered it up again. You know, now it's ditch fill, you know. And, uh, but the leaves are still on it. It looked, you know, a little brown. I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, carry it to the ditch. I said, why don't you get about 10 or 15 pounds of sugar per ton and just roll it, just pour it right out on there and then roll it up and bale it. And, and he, I said, it'll probably come out fine. And it did. And it came out sweet. Yes, the energy is lower. Yes, the protein was lower. But he actually had some feed that the cows liked. It was, a, it was not a bad thing. But it costs some money. So it's an option. What else? Yes, sir. Not not on alfalfa, uh, uh, defense alfalfa. Yeah, yeah. You don't you don't want to start harvesting them uh, those in July. That's a terrible time. You should have harvested it before then. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have my. He wanted to know uh, if he should start harvesting the cool season grasses before. Uh, it got warm. Yes, if you want a higher sugar levels. That's right. Anything else? Yes, sir. Well, sure. You know, these are aerobes, so you have to have some air in there. I'm just saying that you can get it Oh, he wants to know if there's a, I'm sorry. The question was, is there a place for aerating the soil with mechanically? And of course there is, as long as you don't turn it over. That, that would be desirable, but I would prefer to let the, the organisms in the soil do that for me. But there'll be places where you're in a hurry. And, uh, and if you can open up this, it's a desirable thing, especially if you can knock some of this down and punch it in the soil because then you're feeding the organism at the same time. But it costs money, so it's completely up to you. Okay? Yeah. You're nuking it. You're drying it, causing... If you have a, a a drought come through for a week or two, not even a drought, man-made drought, you, uh, you have nothing to, to trap the soil. Also, you don't bring up the organic matter. Organic matter traps moisture in the ground. The higher organic matter, the less a drought will even bother you because it's trapped the moisture. Carbon, uh, one unit of carbon will hold 12 carb uh, units of water. So would I harp? No. <laughs> but, you know, I live in Wisconsin, and, y you know, if you don't have some hay, you have a problem in the winter. <laughs> so that's why covering it with something is a desirable thing. Somebody else? Yes, sir? Exactly right. That's right. They stop, they stop photosynthesizing. The energy isn't as high. That's right. And if you watch them, they'll they'll tell you, you know, there, there's not there's not uh, there'll be some cool times during the night, you know, and when just when the sun's coming up. So then the cool season grass, it'll be variable. You know when they will change that but when it's once it gets toasty hot they the cool season grasses they don't eat they just don't you know of course you can force them everybody does that you're going to eat it or die so usually they get sick and 
then you bring them something else to eat. Yes, sir. Well, it depends on where you live in the world, <laughs> but uh, uh, stockpiling it, the plant never stops growing. It's always green. And the only reason that it's always green is because you kept it in a vegetative state by just eating part of it. And, it, and that, I, so much stuff I didn't go over. I will go over it this afternoon. Please remember that. Okay, please, that's very important. Okay, uh, so I, will you be here this afternoon? Please, please remember, because that's very important. I, I didn't talk about how you can increase the tons of, uh, of, of grass per acre by three or four times by how you graze. I didn't do that, but uh, we'll get to it this afternoon. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yes, it's going to make a difference on on when you when you move those animals during the time of day. That's exactly right. But there'll be some times in the day when they don't want to eat, and and it's usually you know dead heat and it's a hundred degrees, but they always come out in in the in the early morning or at dusk. They can eat all they need in those periods of times. Don't force them. Don't say, this is what you got. I'll move you tomorrow. Don't do that. Okay? And I'll talk more about cows and sheep and pigs and stuff later. Anything else? I, th I, th I think it's in my time. Is it? Oh, I got Tim. Ten minutes. It's 2.30. We can cruise on. Okay, well, I didn't know. I thought it was over at 12.30. I thought it was over at 2.30. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. I I can't see the... Oh, all right. <laughs> oh, good. I was, a, I was rushing things. Other questions? Well, then, well, let's talk about this grazing thing. I'd have to erase some other stuff that nobody really wanted to see because I made it sound too complicated. All right. No, this is not a dead grass plant, but you can see it better on the video. So, all right. Oh, I have to put the sun up here. This is the only thing I got a good grade on when I was in the fifth grade is making suns. Uh, blue. Oh, I let that one dry up. Oh, well. Black water. All right. <coughs> now, if you look at this grass plant, where is the energy highest in this grass plant? Remember, we got water coming up in here. We got plenty of gas from Washington coming in here. All right, and we got plenty of sunlight. Now, remember what they told you in fifth or sixth grade, 
that the sunlight doesn't come over here and make a turn and go in here. We know that. It goes in a straight line, right? Okay. So that sunlight is going to hit where? In the top part of the plant. So if you test it, the, the sugar levels or the hydrogen content, whatever you want to call it, the energy is highest in this part of the plant. And if you turn a cow out or a sheep or a goat into a new paddock, and if you have the time to stand there and actually watch, you'll see that they just take a bite and move on. They don't come down here and eat it all the way to the ground, go to the next one. They don't do that. Watch them. All right. When a grass plant is munched, okay, m maybe it's not this much. Maybe it's half. I don't, I don't care. But it's just a part of that grass plant. What happens when that occurs is the roots don't die back. I don't know why everybody says that the roots die back. That's crap. But what does happen is the sap in the roots down here comes out of here and goes back to replenish this part. The roots are still there. They didn't go anywhere. Now, so it sucks all the juice out of there and grows this plant material back. Now, if you give it enough time, then once it's back to the the height that it was before, now you can, it will start replenishing the fluids in those roots. And if you let it grow just a little bit more before you come back to graze it, you will actually lengthen those roots. Okay? So when you come back to graze again, now you're grazing this part. I'm exaggerating, of course. And the roots d die back. And, and it replaces it. And then you let it grow just a little bit taller. And then it gets a little bit deeper. Now you see what's happening? I'm getting more roots and deeper roots and they're going to be able to harvest more minerals that you couldn't get before and they're going to be able to tap more water than was there before most of the organic matter doesn't come from the roots all dying it comes from you guys knocking this grass down and feeding the bacteria which feed the roots which feeds the plant it's a cycle when you start jumping in there and saying, well, I can do, you know, that's when you get rid of all your money. So what is this? This is your stockpile. All right. So we're continually, this, is, this plant now is not undergoing any stress because it's still in a vegetative state. When a plant is under stress, it will go to seed. Go out there and mow your lawn every day and just let it sit. In three days, you're going to have seed everywhere. But if you keep letting it grow and keep it in a vegetative state. Now, let's say you got up here to this stage right here, and, and it's, uh, oh, it's September. And, and then you decide not to graze it or mow it or do whatever you do. So what's going to happen? Well, the plant stop, hasn't stopped growing, so it's probably going to go to seed on you because you didn't keep it in a vegetative state. So when it goes to seed, then the sap goes back down into the roots, the potassium goes back down, and the protein goes back down, and you don't have as good a quality forage. But if you keep it in a vegetative state, this stuff will stay green clear through December. 
I've seen it. Okay. You understand what I'm saying about vegetative state and, and stockpile? This is the stockpile. And if you come along and, and of course, you're not, every plant is not going to stay up like this. Every plant's not going to stay up by this. Uh, uh, some of them, if you're harvesting, however you're doing that, you're knocking some of this green down here on the ground, and it's going to be ate by the organisms. Some of it's going to stand back up. Some of it never will fall over. But you will increase your production or tons per acre of grass by I used to believe it was just two or three times, but I've seen it. I've seen it 10 to 12. What that means is, instead of uh, one cow to three acres, I can have three cows to one acre. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, anyway. Yes, I knew there was going to be a question. I knew it. Okay. Yes, yes, but one, one thing that you've got to be aware of that w we're, we don't think about is, is if you've got a lot of organic matter in the soil because you've been doing it right for a couple of years, that traps heat too. This plant may not stop growing until January when it's 10 below zero. That means it's still photosynthesizing maybe not a lot but some so organic matter is a huge deal and the only way you get organic matter is put some of this down here and nobody wants to do that because it's a waste wait, wait a minute probably that's right Unless it's fro unless the plant is frozen, you know it can fr freeze solid the plant, uh, you know twenty below and still stay green, but when it thaws back out, it doesn't just fall over dead. It it starts again. You bet. You bet. It's exactly right, and it can happen with any. It won't happen with the warm season grass, but it will the cool season grasses. Now, yeah. It can, yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. Want some? Oh. Ah, okay. He w the question was, can you, on your, when you're, if you're using cover crops, can you mow it off once in a while and, and so it gets knocked down here on the ground to feed? Will that be the same as using an animal to do it? Yes. Yeah, it's a very desirable thing to do. Y yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, you're, uh, it will not hurt the plant. Oh, wants to know uh, on the, the question is, uh, in the middle of the winter when everything's frozen, it, even though it's still green, and you graze it to the ground, is it uh, detrimental to that plant uh, for the next year? It's not detrimental to the plant, but if you graze it, down to here it's detrimental to these guys because now you don't have anything covering the soil you don't have any organic matter keeping the moisture from uh, leaving and the sun from getting in there so that's the only 
you know, uh, Alan Savory says that, you know, it, it has to do with time. Well, of course, but he forgot. <laughs> I, I explained it to him a couple of times, uh, but sometimes Alan, well, he listens sometimes. Uh, but if you don't have any cover, you're nuking the bacteria and you're drying the soil. And that's not desirable. So, but the plant, it's okay, because it'll come back. The other thing is, if you don't have any cover here, besides the moisture and, and the food for the organism, you now have sunlight to, to get to a maybe a less desirable plant thistle or whatever, something that you don't like or the cow doesn't like, okay? So, yes and no. What else? Yes, sir. That's because of cool season, warm season grasses. <coughs> but if you, it, it all amounts to the amount of time that you're going to come around and graze it again. If you have uh, more organic matter down here on the ground, you are trapping moisture. You're feeding organisms. And yes, it's getting hot, but what happens with evaporation? cooling so you've changed that environment you have a cooling effect so now your cool season grasses grow and photosynthesize a little bit longer because you've actually got an air conditioner but nobody thinks about it but it's a good idea works did I answer your question okay Yes, it happens, and usually that's when they go to seed, but you can fix it so that doesn't occur just by uh, eliminating the stress on the plant by not grazing it so low and trapping moisture. Yes, sir. Exactly right. I, even if you're a corn farmer, one thing you should do is cover crop that thing, and the next thing you should do is bring cows out to stomp it down, to eat some of it, and to fertilize with a bacteria source. Did you know that's most of that manure that come out of the back end of the cow is not undigested feed? Most of it's bacteria. Oh, but he, that doesn't count. Well, yeah, it does. So if it is, but you have to have fence and we can't do that. It's too much like work. Anything else? Ooh. I think we started questions too, <laughs> too soon. Yeah, go ahead. My, he wanted to know about crop rotation rotating corn and beans and alfalfa or whatever. My recommendation is never, ever do that, ever. Because every time you plow it down or whatever, you've changed the bacteria culture. You killed off the bacteria, and now you're starting over again. You're using some of the carbon that you developed. Now, can you... Is there a happy medium where you can do some of that? Of course there is. I'm on the opposite end of the crop farmer. I got cows. I like cows. I, I eat cows. So, But, but the, 
the crop farmer is a necessity too. So uh, the more cover crops that you can use at the same time, you know, you can grow corn and certain under uh, crops underneath that, green, I don't know what, I don't know those things, but I know you can do it. So do more of that. Do you have to go from corn to beans to alfalfa? No, you don't have to. The reason they go to alfalfa is because of the, fun, the fungi that puts uh, 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 nitrogen back in the soil so that you don't have to buy so much nitrogen. I just showed you a way you could do that. And you don't have to use, any, you don't have to use alfalfa, high price seed. Plant a bunch of cover crop and put it all in the ground. Let the cows eat some of it. There's, there's, there's no perfect answer. It's only a perfect answer that fits your s situation. Uh, that's all I can tell you. Yes, sir. The, the best way to measure the soil, to determine the soil health and the ability for it to feed a plant, number one is carbon. Now you can call it organic matter. I happen to have a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen analyzer that I use for stuff. And you can use it on soil, but you can get it done anywhere and just Find out how much carbon is in it. The higher the carbon, the more you have health in the soil. And the only way to get carbon in the soil is not by going and buying some coal or, or uh, uh, carbon dust or something and throw it in there. That's not going to help because that doesn't feed bacteria. You have to have a carbohydrate. Sugars, starches, fats, proteins, not carbon dust. Okay, so that's number one, because if you have organic matter, then you have biological activity. If you have biological activity, you have corrected pH automatically, because they're going to make some of those inorganic elements that you have that you think you need to spray on there or put on there all the time. They're going to make the ones that are already there in an available form, not in a rock form. They're going to take that calcium carbonate and break that thing down and use that calcium so you don't have to buy anymore. You guys got lots of calcium out there. You just, it's just not available. Well, how do you get those things available? Bugs, worms, nematodes. Oh, terrible, nematode, what, whatever. Biological activity is the answer. Okay. Right. If you have, if you have, uh, if you have plant, if, if you have plants that are growing and they're green and they're, they are, uh, their immune function is not working properly. One of the ways you could tell is by checking a sugar bricks reading, and you'll see that it's kind of low, and that's a good sign that that plant is sick. And a sick plant allows critters to eat it. If you've got a high sugar brick level plant and it's, it's photosynthesizing properly and it's got a lot of the right minerals coming up in there, those army worms and those other nematodes, all those little critters that eat the plant won't eat the plant. It's, it's related to how you grazed or harvested and what you did by 
fertilizing or not fertilizing. This was uh, one of the ones I've noticed on, that was alfalfa field, and they harvest, and they harvest every three weeks, they harvest, and so there's no organic matter in the soil, and then it dried up, so it was a little bit of a drought, so you can't make sugars. So you got a sick plant. All right, now you to listen to me some more. You have to come back at three. Since we have a bunch of new people here, and now we're dealing with a subject that I, I find more interesting than just grass, we have the mic working so you guys can hear. It's wonderful. All right. <coughs> to start with, I've got to repeat some of what I talked about at the first session because some of you haven't been here before because it's extremely important to know these things. You have to understand what energy is, okay? Energy or biological energy is the digestion and use of carbohydrates. Carbon supplies 9,000 calories per gram, okay? Can't burn pure carbon. Diamond rings don't burn very well. Hydrogen supplies 25,000 calories per gram. So it, the carbon must be in some way attached, the hydrogen attached to the carbon to be able to burn or utilize it. But you can't have all positives. Oxygen is a negative 3,125 calories per gram, okay? The reason you need to know this is because most of the stuff you deal with are carbohydrates. Sugars, starches, fats, waxes, even proteins are carbohydrates. So, if you have a carbohydrate, we'll just take this one, my methane, and you're going to burn it, or, by the way, the cell of the body is not unlike a gasoline engine, in that you burn a carbohydrate, and the end products of burning, here you add some oxygen, whoop, and you yield carbon dioxide, which we breathe out, and water, which we sweat or urinate out, and then some heat or work is done, or some calories are utilized. If you want to test this, carbon weighs, nine, uh, weighs 12, so 12 times 9,000 is 108,000 calories. Hydrogen weighs one, four times the 25,000 calories, so there you got uh, 100,000 calories. So that's 208,000 calories on this one molecule. This is plus. But we have, by the way, we have to balance this ration because we have two oxygens over here and not enough oxygen. So there's three and we don't have enough over here. All right. So we're going to adjust the carburetor. Now we've got four oxygens and two, four. And if you take that Oxygen weighs 16 times 4, so you have a negative, let's see, I wrote this out, oh yeah. You have a negative 200,000 calories. So you got a net, a net gain of 8,000 calories. So if you want to know those things, you can go to all that, but you got to make sure that you balance the ration.
Now, part of this balancing the ration, you think, you think this doesn't apply to cows or to people, but it does. If I have a ration that has not enough oxygen, that means I can't utilize all the carbon and the hydrogen. What did I just say? I said, the feed efficiency is terrible. You didn't know that was part of it, did you? So, in a, in a human body or in a cow, if I have a low oxygen diet, you could say low in sugars and starches if you wish, you, the, the cell of the body will start producing ketones, the burning of fat in the absence of oxygen. So you get ketosis. If you're a human, you call it diabetic coma or the Atkins diet, which it doesn't, it's the same thing. It works very well. And if you pay attention to what he said in the Atkins diet, you will only do that extreme high protein, high fat, in other words, low oxygen diet, for a very short period of time. And then you start introducing more sugars or starches into the diet so that, so that your uh, liver doesn't fall off and you all die. But you will lose a lot of weight very quickly, but it's hard to do. So an oxygen deficient diet is the Atkins diet. So you don't want that on your cows if you're or, uh, trying to produce meat or milk, you're not going to produce as much, they're going to lose weight. So the next thing is, what happens if I have too much oxygen? Well, you all know what a two, uh, uh, an excessive oxygen diet causes. Take your cow or your sheep or your whatever animal it is and just feed it nothing but a high starch, high sugar diet. Corn. Oh, that's that poisonous food. Remember? You, you, you guys do know that corn's poisonous now, right? Uh, it's a seed of a grass plant. Get over it. <laughs> okay, but it happens to have an excessive amount of oxygen. So if you feed an oxygen excess diet, you get, first thing that happens is you get drying of the mucous membranes, which is part of the immune function and you'll get an animal that coughs. If you've ever been to a feedlot or somewhere where they're feeding a lot of hogs, you hear this dry cough, like they have something stuck in their throat. And that's an oxygen excess ration. If it goes far enough, you get excess lactic acid production in the rumen, the rumen stops uh, fermenting, and then the animal goes off feed and loses weight and maybe dies. Founder, uh, stiff muscles uh, caused by excess lactic acid production. All of that is from an oxygen excess ration. Displaced the abomasum. That's another one. Oxygen excess ration. But nobody says it in those terms. Uh, they say uh, too much starch or too much sugars. Okay. If you, if you look at some, let me do some erasing here. If you look at some feeds, let's look at corn, really poisonous thing you don't want to feed, has an oxygen content. Oh, by the way, in the cell of the body, I don't care whether it's a cow or a chicken or you, the oxygen balance uh, 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 the percentage of the diet should be 40.5% oxygen on a dry matter basis. Well, it's this 40 and a half percent, don't confuse, it's, it's the same as how much phosphorus do you need? You need 0.3 percent phosphorus or so much calcium. It's just another mineral element. Don't get confused, it, it's nothing special. So if I have a 40 and a half percent oxygen on a dry matter basis in that ration, then I am not going to get acidosis and I'm not going to get ketosis. And I'm going to get the most use, the most energy produced. If I don't have enough oxygen, I can't get all the calories produced. Just remember, it's a bunch like 
a gasoline engine. If I stick a rag in the carburetor, how fast am I going to go? Not very fast. And how much fuel will you use? A huge amount of fuel just to go a very little ways. So balancing the oxygen is as important as how much octane you got. So if you're feeding a high energy feed to an animal, if you don't have enough oxygen, you can't utilize it anyway. Also, if you have too much oxygen, then you start going the other way also. So this balancing of this oxygen, or sugars and starches to proteins and fats, it's another way to say it, is extremely important for feed efficiency and health of that animal. And it doesn't matter whether it's a person or whether it's a cow. If you want to see an oxygen excess ration in children, uh, don't do it to children, do it to yourself. Eat nothing but candy bars. That's high in sugar, very high oxygen. You will start getting dry of the mucous membrane and you will start getting respiratory diseases. And, and if you remember, after you get over it, what caused it, then you won't do that to your cows either. All right, corn, the shelled corn, has an oxygen content of 46% on average. Now, everybody's corn is a little different. High oil corns, high lysine corns, this corn, that corn, is all, they're all different. And, and they will vary. Now, if I crack or grind that corn, what happens? Oxidation happens. So this oxygen may increase as much as up to 48%. Well, if the oxygen increased, what, ha what else decreased? Because you only get 100%, you know. Well, the hydrogen content, that's the true energy, is, six, er, is averaging 6.85%. But if I let it oxidize, I grind this corn and I let it oxidize, it would probably go down to about 6.65. Now you're talking about 25,000 calories per gram. Well, that's a huge drop. So it, it's, it needs to, you need to be aware of, of what, what you're doing. Don't grind your corn two weeks ahead of time. If you're making hay, don't crimp the hay. Your energy will go down. What do you need to produce? You need energy. Well, let's look at, uh, okay, uh, molasses. Molasses is mostly a sugar, averages 50% oxygen. What's the hydrogen content? 6.5. Everybody feeds molasses because they think it's high in energy. No, it's not high in energy. It's high in oxygen. You may need that on lush green grass. In the spring of the year, grass, 36 to 37 percent oxygen. So what happens on that lush green grass? It's low in oxygen. I don't get good utilization, do I? So the animal eats more. So I, uh, you have a, 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 a little area where there's some dead grass out there. And you're rotating your animals around and the first place they go is <laughs> they go and eat that dead grass. Why do you suppose that is? It's not high in energy, but it's high in oxygen, so they can utilize the energy that the grass has. The grass probably has a uh, hydrogen content of 6.10%. Yes? What does sunlight do to wilting hay? What does sunlight do to wilting hay? Well, it'll still be photosynthesizing, okay? Uh, on a wilted grass plant, you just, you cut off and it's, 
you will still get some photosynthesis. Uh, but eventually that's going to stop. Is that what you're wanting to know? Doesn't sunlight actually try to break the hay down, and the longer it's exposed to sunlight, the worse it is? Is that why it's not, just turns dark over time? It's not the sunlight, it's the oxygen. It's oxidation. Oxidation. And that's caused by oxygen in the air, oxidation reduction reaction. So you're gaining oxygen, you're losing hydrogen. You, you, uh, you sealed it a little. The edges still got brown, but you sealed it so that you have less oxidation. If you had wrapped it, it would be even less. So you're losing energy and gaining oxygen when, you're, when you cut the grass plant. No, no. <laughs> it's exactly right. It's not sunlight, it's oxygen. That's why I tell people don't ever crimp, but nobody pays no attention to me anyway. Why does when you crimp it, you break the seal. Yeah, more, more, way, more areas for oxygen to start oxidizing that plant. It's like grinding corn. Which has more energy, a whole shell corn or one that you ground two weeks ago? A whole shell corn. Never crimp. But you do what you have to do. Oxidation. A bad thing. You lose energy. What did you buy that corn or that plant for? You bought it for energy. Yes. That... That's up to you. <laughs> uh, they wa she wanted to know, uh, 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 should we all be making haylage? Well, it's a better way to trap the energy. You will have more energy, but it costs more to do. So uh, uh, it's up to you. Uh, okay, okay. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the supplement for fodder bales or something like that, would that help you or would that hurt you? Would supplementing on lush green pasture in the spring of the year help or hurt you on on this lush green grass with this low oxygen? And with corn fodder bales or corn stock bales. Oh, with corn fodder, okay, or corn stock bales. No, no, we're just going to talk about that right now. All right. Uh, uh, corn fodder. Uh, corn fodder will probably run about 43% oxygen. And probably, depending on if you uh, grind it before you you chopped it up or, or how you harvest, when you harvested it, when you wrap it into a, because the longer you leave it lay, the more uh, oxygen you're going to get. So, uh, 40, at least 43, and a hydrogen probably of 5.6. Now, what's going to happen here is something that you have to remember. The natural instinct for any animal is not to make babies for you not to make milk, meat, wool. They don't care about you. I know you think that that's their job, but it is not their job. Their job is to live from today until tomorrow. That's it. Okay? Get it out of your head that you have the best... Pr no, they don't care about you. And the only thing that they require to live from today until tomorrow is fat, back fat. And the only thing that you need to 
make bat fat or to make lots of back fat is energy. You don't need protein. You don't need no minerals and vitamins and all those good things. You just need energy. So that means that the animal is going to go out and search for the highest energy feed stuff it can put its mouth on. Well, which one is that? Well, this one. But for some reason, it went to chemistry class and knew that it had to have some oxygen to burn some of that. So it will eat some of this. And I'm sure they know it's oxygen. Well, maybe not. But they will eat some of this, and they will perform better. But they will still prefer this. Probably 5% of their ration might be this, maybe. But it will also depend on how high the energy is here. If you put in uh, some uh, soybean oil, another terrible product, uh, has a 13% hydrogen. The only trouble is it only has a 13% oxygen. Yes? You could, but molasses would work there, wouldn't it? But there's a problem with molasses. The problem with molasses is it's 4.5% potassium. <coughs> and uh, it's an excess that you don't want to have happen. Uh, uh, I'll just go to that. They get benefit, but they also... They want to know, uh, I'm sorry, the, to repeat the question, he wants to know why w should you feed molasses on less green grass in the spring? On green grass. On, on green grass. Like, like right, green. right. It's desirable because you increase the oxygen and you increase the energy. The only detriment is that it happens to be high in potassium. Molasses will run 4.5% potassium. I'll go to that right now. In the cell of the body, the osmotic pressure inside the cell of the body, your body, the cow, it don't matter, is controlled by potassium. Okay? The osmotic pressure outside of the cell is controlled by sodium. Now, if you look at green grass, an analysis of green grass, let me change colors here so that maybe you can see it. Uh, potassium content on green grass, uh, cool season grasses, probably runs anywhere from uh, 1.5 to 4%. The requirement of the body for potassium is 0.93 percent. So you can see you have an excess. Sodium, sodium, potassium con concentration in the plant is 0.01 percent. The requirement is 0.24 percent. So you can see you need a one to four ratio, but you have an extreme excess of potassium to sodium. <laughs> so what happens is you can get waste out of the cell, but you cannot get food into the cell, okay? Because of this, this pressure gradient. Now, uh, usually people say, well, if that's true, then the cow would starve to death and die. No, uh, uh, because God knew we were going to screw the th this whole thing up. He made what we call the sodium-potassium-ATP.
TP pump. And its job is to pump food in against this pressure gradient. Now, let's does this cause a problem if we have this going on, this leaking? I had an experiment that I gave to told people to use it, and I don't want you to do it. Please don't do this. Don't even think about it. I had a, a young student at a university, let's see where, uh, it was in, down in Kentucky. Maybe that was why he did it, I don't know. Uh, uh, and I said, go out and eat some bananas. Eat 20 bananas. Bananas are low in protein, but they're very high in potassium. Eat 20 bananas, and you will experience a potassium excess. Okay? So this idiot, went <laughs> college, oh my God, went out, ate 10 bananas, went out with his buddies, ate a double cheeseburger and a milkshake, came back and ate 10 more bananas. He was in the bathroom all night. And if it had been somebody older like me, we'd have had a heart attack and died. So, because it has a great deal to do with your, with your heart. So, please don't do this. Yes. So you're at this point. So if you're feeding free choice minerals, okay? They, so they have salt. Are they going to go take sodium? Are they going to intake sodium to balance that with, with that combination with that's, grass molasses and sodium? That's a very good question. No. An animal will not or cannot free choice an excess of something to counteract an excess here. I wished it would happen that way. It, it can't, yeah, it cannot overeat. It will, it will eat more salt and or sodium, but it will not eat enough to overcome this. Because not only do you have to then do this, there's more than one mineral that you now have to deal with. An excess of one thing makes many others unavailable. Now you've got everything messed up. So when you put cattle on that lush green grass in the spring and, and they have diarrhea and you don't want to walk behind them and you all say it's from protein excess, maybe not. Maybe it's potassium excess. So if you've got a potassium excess, you're going to lower lower your rate of gain by quite a bit because it's taking a lot of energy, ATP, to force food into that to keep the animal gaining or to keep the animal alive. So it's a negative. So you want to, you just don't want an excess. Yes, sir. No, 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 that's okay. Yes. 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 He, he, the question was, is the, where is the potassium highest in the grass plant? The potassium is what transports the nitrogen up in the plant from the roots, as in mostly potassium nitrate. That's where the most of it is. So if you graze low, you're going to get not only more non-protein nitrogen, in a nitrate form or in a, a urea form, but you will also get a higher amount of potassium. So there's where people get confused whether they are uh, getting an excess of potassium or an excess of protein. That's why everybody says it's protein. No, no, that's not true. It's potassium that's causing this terrible diarrhea. Now, what I want you to notice about this ATP, ATP is, uh, I never pronounce it right, adenosine, which is a protein, triphosphate. So the energy of the cell of the body is phosphorus, not carbohydrate. The carbohydrate goes into the mitochondria of the cell and it 
cruises around in there and makes ATP. Happens in the plant, too. That's the reason my corn plant had, had uh, lower hydrogen now than it used to have. Because if you look at it, the phosphorus content in the grain, corn, cor seed corn, or the corn plant, uh, went in the 1960s from 0.37%. Now it's around 0 0.27. So the shelled corn doesn't have as much energy as it used to have. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, uh, does it make a difference between open pollinated and hybrid? Yes, it did. Uh, it, uh, uh, most of that on the open pollinated uh, is not genetically modified, which caused a, its own set of problems. And, uh, but the main problem is, is because uh, the, the people growing corn uh, fertilized uh, improperly, the government came around and said, you can't put out phosphorus anymore. You have to limit the amount of phosphorus you put on the soil. You know, you gotta stop this runoff. Well, you could have changed that and, and fixed that so you didn't with cover crops and other stuff, but Nobody did, so the phosphorus level is now lower, therefore the energy is lower, therefore the oxygen is higher. So fertilizing with phosphorus might be a good idea if you do it properly. Okay. So ATP is what you want to, by the way, uh, ATP is also produced in the grass plants, all plants. Well, they have some other GTP and other, but that's too deep. But just remember, phosphorus is the cellular energy source. It's real important to know that. Unfortunately, it's an expensive mineral element. Okay. Did I answer your, yeah, okay. Sometimes I get lost. <laughs> yes, sir. The question is, can you uh, free choice some phosphorus and then the animal take up whatever phosphorus it requires and then they will transport that, uh, they'll util util I'm sorry, utilize it and then uh, through its waste material put the phosphorus back on the ground and improve the phosphorus. Yes. And it takes about seven years and you'll never have to fertilize. Uh, but you also have to use a, a biologically available form, of course. So, uh, absolutely, you can do that. A biologically available source. In other words, if you go down there and get some uh, rock phosphate, it's not going to work. Sounds good, but it won't work. All right. Okay, any, oth any other questions? All right, now we understand a little about energy, a little about uh, one mineral excess, potassium. Well, we're gonna erase all this. Takes up time if I erase slow. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I could go to another board, but then you'd be too far away for some people. All right. Next. After I've balanced the ration for oxygen so that I get the best utilization for that feed. I mean, I don't want to feed it if it's not going to do anything and just fall out the back end as, as fertilizer. 
I mean, maybe fertilizer is a good thing, but then it doesn't pay as good. So I want the feed efficiency to be pretty good. So I balance the oxygen. I, I balance the oxygen, and then I balance the energy to the protein. Well, uh, the problem is this is a protein. Oh, it's my protein. So all you chemists know that I, I can do this if I want. All right. This is a carbohydrate. Sugars, starches, fats, waxes. They're, they're all carbohydrates. Now I'm going to make that thing into... I'm touching the buttons here. <laughs> I'm going to change that into a protein. There it is. Now that should say to you, when I feed protein, do the bacteria in the rumen use that for protein or are they using it for energy? Or do you have any idea which one it is? Nobody checks. We just get more milk, so it's got to be protein, right? Well, maybe not. All right. Because what occurs in the rumen, the cow doesn't decide nothing. It's the bacteria that decide everything. And they're going to take that protein if they require more energy. And they're going to deaminize it and release this ammonia as a gas. Oh, by the way, if I give you a high energy diet and a low protein diet, you put on fat. If I have a high protein diet and a low energy diet, I get a thin cow. And I'll show you why. Because the bacteria need more energy, they're going to release this ammonia as a gas, by the way, this rumen <coughs> has a bacteria culture that likes a certain pH to grow and multiply the best. Okay? It's got the food source and the moisture and the heat. But now we've introduced some protein and they deaminized it because they needed more energy, they needed more carbohydrate, and they needed less nitrogen and so this ammonia is released and this ammonia is an alkaline gas so it's going to depress the growth and multiplication of bacteria in the rumen well who cares all right uh, if it's released fast enough this is this is the gas that causes the bloat when you have a modern clover alfalfa or something this is what it is so if you want to neutralize it put in some vinegar uh, acetic acid and it'll neutralize that ammonia and make an ammonium acetate gas and and you can go on down the road but it would have been a whole bunch easier if you just reduced the protein of the diet and increased the energy but you know whatever you want all right now I hope you can see this. This is the this is the bloodstream. Perfect bloodstream. Oh, by the way, I know I know that there's more than one stomach in a ruminant. Just so you know, just so, and it's they're they're hidden back here. So <coughs> by the way, those other stomachs are uh, not fermentation stomachs, they, they work more on an acid uh, digestion process and if you're putting more alkaline substances back there you're going to reduce digestion more of the food and absorption. Alright, now the rumen wall is gas permeable so that means this gas can go right into the bloodstream this ammonia gas. And when it gets in there, it's called 
blood urea nitrogen. Your doctor checks you for that just to see if you've been eating too much meat. All right. And, uh, or too many candy bars, one or the other. Uh, <coughs> this blood urea nitrogen, this ammonia attaches to the red blood cell. It's now what they call met hemoglobin. Okay. So this met hemoglobin gets transported. It is now a waste material. It cannot be used to make meat or milk. It has to be gone, uh, transported down here to the liver and the kidneys, where it's supposedly flushed down. If you ever seen a filler that didn't plug up, well, let's say it say plug up. That's kind of kind of coarse. It can't get rid of it. There's a bypass valve in there, so it can't get rid of all the urine urea nitrogen. By the way, you can test for urine urea nitrogen. You can actually test it for pH. If the pH of the urine is seven, things are pretty good. Energy to protein ratio on the diet's good. But if the pH is eight or nine, you're feeding protein for energy. If it's below, if it's uh, five or six, it means you could use some more protein and you could get some better rate of gain. Okay. So what happens if this can't flush out all the urea that's going in, in the system? Well, one of the things it does is it goes to uh, this bloodstream going around to the lungs. What were the lungs for? You remember this, probably in the eighth grade they taught you this. I, th I don't even remember. I was probably asleep. It has to do with the transport of carbon dioxide, which is a waste material out of the cell from metabolism. Carbon dioxide, you know, you breathe out. So you got carbon dioxide that's supposed to be transported to the lungs, but it's not because it's going to be limited because of the blood urea nitrogen. And you're supposed to take oxygen in, but that isn't going to happen because you have too much ammonia in the system, too much blood urea nitrogen. Now I have an experiment for you to prove what I'm saying about this is true. I want you to take this material by this little fertilizer plant, urea. Get a great big handful of urea and go out to the best, highest dollar cow or sheep or goat that you have and shove it in his mouth and let him get a drink and he might get 10 steps and he'll die and and what the test is is you cut its throat and look at the color of the blood the blood will be chocolate colored proving that you couldn't take up any oxygen because there was too much ammonia in the system No. <laughs> the, the reason I told you to use the highest dollar cow is so that you will remember. <laughs> this is also the same thing as nitrate poisoning. You've heard of nitrate poisoning. It's the same thing. Nitrate is just a... Uh, well, that's what a nitrate is. Same thing. On prussic acid poisoning, uh, you know, they've got all kinds of names for it. Hydrogen cyanide, all the same. That causes the blockage of here. What, uh, let's say it's not so much that it kills the animal. So if we have an interference of oxygen and carbon dioxide here uh, exchange, what happens to the cow? Well, uh, let's take a nice, humid, warm day. 
so the molecules of the oxygen are farther apart. And you have animals standing under a tree going <sighs> and you say, well, it's because it's hot out. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you've been feeding too much protein and they just can't breathe properly. Maybe. One thing that happens is if you have a pond, they all start walking out in the middle of the pond. Why would they do that? Oh, they want to cool down. With evaporation, you get cooling and you get more concentration of oxygen molecules. Could that be it? Oh, no, that's too much chemistry. Uh, yeah. Yeah, whatever. All right. Now, uh, if you're in the milking business, Uh, uh, a straight line four, in line four. All right, if you're in the milking business, you're going to get some blood urea nitrogen down here, and it's called now milk urea nitrogen. I don't know whether anybody milks in this part of the country, but milk urea nitrogen. Milk urea nitrogen is not a very desirable thing to have either. In China, if your MUN test gets over 16.5, they refuse, or if it gets to 16.5, they have to ref they refuse your milk. You have to just dump it. They get 50 cents a pound for their milk. So it's a big deal. Over here, we can have 18, 20, it don't matter. You, you know, you can poison anybody. So, so <coughs> The problem with milk urea nitrogen is the urea part. What did I say happened here? I say the bacteria get in, broke that down and released ammonia as a gas. Can that happen here? Sure. What does it take to grow a batch of bacteria? Good bacteria, bad bacteria. It takes moisture. We got moisture. Takes a food source. Oh, we got that. Takes temperature, right temperature, nice and warm. Takes the proper organism that you want or don't want to grow. And it takes the correct pH. Guess which bacteria love an alkaline pH? E. coli, salmonella, staph, strep, coliform. Oh, a really good one. And what do they cause? High somatic cell count, mastitis. Oh, well, that probably don't matter. You guys got beef cows, right? They never get mastitis. Wrong. Wrong. Oh, by the way, that, that excess potassium that I was talking about earlier and the leaking of the cell, it's also caused, causes utter edema. Do you know utter edema? It's where the cow starts uh, 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 swelling of the udder and, and, uh, and uh, under the belly two weeks before they calve, okay? So, <coughs> so, uh, uh, and it causes the breakdown of the udder. So if you got udder edema, you, you, you'll eventually have an udder that's dragging on the ground and you'll want to get rid of her. Okay, so that's another exciting thing not to have happen uh, for potassium, okay. So, all right, now we killed the cow that way, and we killed the cow that way, and we depressed the cow that way. And let's talk about, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about beef, meat, grass-fed beef. It's the best thing in the world. Unless you fed them wrong. Like on. Do you remember what happened with this ammonia? And it went down here. Is it possible that any of this uh, ammonia goes to the muscle tissue? Like the ribeye? Or whatever? Huh? We're going to have excessive amounts of urea in the muscle tissue. Oh, well, that's okay. No, it's not. 
it's going to make inconsistent meat. There'll be some of your beef that's great, and there'll be some of it that's just awful. And the only reason I know that is because people try to feed me their best grass-fed beef all the time, and I know better than to eat it. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that it happens that way all the time. It will depend on when you butchered it and what the diet was on. I tell this to all, all the people that are grass-feeding fe beef and sheep and all that because it's important or we're going to lose our market. You're go there's going to be people that will not buy your beef if it's one of those that's got that excess ammonia in there. And I don't care. You don't have to believe me. But I'm telling you, it's already happened. And I'm telling you how to prevent it. So how to prevent it is not have a protein excess diet. Don't butcher an animal in the spring of the year on high protein green grass. Don't do that. Or in the fall of the year when it's high protein. Oh, yeah, but that's when I get my best gain. Well, no. On a high protein diet, if I put them on lush green grass at 24% protein, I had to show you this. This is wheat pasture cattle. Do you know wheat pasture? When they bring in 400 pound calves on this pure wheat that they, f that they uh, uh, put out in the fall of the year and then they also grace it in the summer, or spring I mean. And this is a graph. And this is the number of days, 50 days. And 100 days. Now they put the, those animals out there on those pastures 100 days and then they ship directly to a feedlot. And I'm not sure why they picked 100 days and it's usually a feed company or a big feedlot that, that uh, owns the animals and they want them out there so long and I think that's because they, they that's the gain they want. They want the animal to be uh, 700. Well, if you check them animals for the first 50 days, those animals, and you, ch and you weight them at that 50-day period, the average rate of gain is somewhere between 5 to 6 pounds a day. Man, they can turn a crank. That's why wheat pasture is such a good deal. Do you know what the national average for cattle on wheat pasture is, according to the USDA or whoever it does, does that sort of thing? The average gain is somewhere between 1.9 and 2.1. So my question is, if this right here is compensatory gain, what is this? Did they, did they gain anything? Compensatory loss. Isn't that a wonderful thing? This is why I don't want you to feed lush green grass all the time. Because your rate of gain or your milk production will drop like a rock after 45 to 50 days, depending on the protein excess that you have. Okay? An excess of anything is not a good thing. I don't care whether it's protein or minerals or whatever. An excess is a bad thing. So don't lose your production that you've got. Be aware of what the pH of the urine is. Or the MUN test. By the way, if your MUN test, milk urea nitrogen, or the pH of the urine is running nine, the cow is not going to breed back, or sheep, or whatever. pH and nine, they won't breed back. Well, why is that? I d I'm not done killing the cow. I'm, I'm, I'm very good at it. 
this is the intestinal tract, about the last meter before everything falls out on the ground as a nice pile, or not a pile. And this is where probably 85% of all the amino acids and fatty acids and the sugars and the, and the vitamins and the minerals are supposed to be absorbed into the bloodstream. But we already know that if we have too much ammonia, it prevented oxygen uptake. Do you think it's possible that it could interfere with anything else? Oh, well, of course. That's why you've got this rate of gain that drops like this. All right. So if we've got a protein excess, that means certain mineral elements aren't going to get absorbed too. Like uh, phosphorus or selenium. Well, what happens if you don't get enough phosphorus? Of, let's force feed a whole bunch of extra phosphorus and selenium. That'll solve the problem, right? No. Just gets rid of the money out of your pocket because it can't be absorbed, so it comes out and makes really good fertilizer. Okay? So force feeding to overcome an excess doesn't work. All right. I have I have a, a sheep guy that called uh, today, and he has lambs that are born. Uh, uh, they don't live very long, and they're st they get stiff, and they and they just fall over dead. And you know what it is. It's selenium. He's short of selenium. Is that the solution? No. The solution was he's feeding alfalfa to the ewes. Duh. You got a protein excess and it prevents the uptake of selenium and then you get the problem in the, in the, in the lamb. So what are you going to do? Oh, he'll give them shots of selenium. That'll solve it. No, he already lost his money. So an excess of anything is worse than a deficiency. Deficiencies are easy to take care of because the animal, if it can, will just overeat extra food to get those elements. Now, if it can't overeat to get uh, the extra iodine or magnesium that it needs, well, then it'll get a deficiency disease. Let me give you another example of, of this protein excess. I have a guy in northern Wisconsin, uh, central Wisconsin, and uh, I was teaching him how to graze properly. And of course, he's been to a lot of grazing meetings, and so he was already an expert. And, and so uh, every year, and it runs about 250, 300 cows, every year, probably a third have pink eye, at least. Not just the cows, but the calves also. Just, just terrible. And he keeps wanting to buy some mineral to take care of the problem. And you can do a little bit of that, but, but uh, that's not the answer. And I said, all you need to do is rotate the animals faster so that they don't eat down on the grass plant so much, so they don't get so much non-protein nitrogen, and they get a little more energy, and they get a little more oxygen, too. Well, he called back this year, and he said, I want you to know that that worked. He said, I have not had one pink eye. Not one. So if you have a disease like that, back up and look at what you were doing. It wasn't the cow's fault. It was your fault because you did, you forced the animal to do something that it really didn't want to do. It's an excess. Okay. All right, let's see. We killed that cow several times. Yes, sir. Sure.
Right. The, 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 the question is, is if you're bringing in stalkers, 350, 400 pound stalkers, is there some kind of test you can do to see where you are on protein excess so that you can change the diet? Sure. I'm sorry? That's, that's what I tell everybody to do. Keep them 50 days and ship them. Get another bunch. Don't worry about the test. Don't worry about the test at all. 50 days. Now, yes, there is a, there, you could take a blood test and check for blood urea nitrogen. That's a pain in the neck. <laughs> get you some pH paper, pH of 4 to 9. If you can't find it, get a hold of me and I'll get you. They're only like 5 bucks and it'll last you a year until you wash them or get <laughs> then they don't work quite as well but just go out there and check the pH of the urine please don't do it on the soil because it'll give you a false reading you have to do it off of grass or a cup if you're fast enough I, I don't know and by the way the best way to do it is you put the pH tape in your pocket uh, because if the cow sees you they won't urinate They'll just wait. Uh, you think this is a joke. You just try it. You have it out there, they'll, they'll just, I, I don't know. But just check the pH. If the pH is anything under seven, you're good to go. Actually, you could go to eight because the liver and the kidneys do have the ability to get rid of some of the excess. So you can, but if it hits nine, you, they aren't going to gain anything. You just wasted your time to keep them out there. So that pH is a real slick way to do it. Check more than one. The first one will lie to you. Uh, you know, I'm serious about that. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, and, and, you know, check four or five or six of them. And then you'll, then you'll be on your, on your way. pH paper? Oh, you can, uh, the vet probably can get it for you. Uh, your high school uh, chemistry car class. Uh, you just look up on the internet, pH paper. You know, get the one from four to nine in a roll. So not the, each, you can get them by s little sticks like swimming pool stuff, but that's too expensive. For five bucks you can get a roll. So. Yeah, just rip off this little piece and dip it in the urine, and, and it has a color code there. It's used in chemistry all the time. Oh, the, pH, uh, the pH you want it to be for maximum production on the animal is 7, pH of the urine. If it's below that, you need more protein because you're putting on fat and not muscle or milk. So... But if you get over, you start creating these other problems. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, sure, yes. Uh, it would be pretty low, uh, probably in the two, because then you'll start using, losing uh, muscle uh, to maintain the animal so yeah you have to eat two or something like that I've never had anybody have anything that low but you lose a lot of milk when it hits uh, seven and eight you're if, if it's a dairy cow your production is quite low and you get a huge increase by in, by raising the protein so but then you have to weigh the cost of the protein to the gain that you get. I don't know what that would be. Yes? Very good. You all have this? You want me to go to a different board and leave this? No, you don't care. You want me to erase it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, the question was, 
uh, is rotational grazing a good way to eliminate some of these problems? Uh, yes, and it can also be a good way to exacerbate them, <laughs> make them a lot worse. So I'm going to show you how to do that. I believe they're recording this, so if if I erase stuff and you need to see, you can get a copy from Practical Farmers. Sure. I was hoping that I could slow him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's a stupid thing to do. Is fall calving, sorry. <laughs> In northern Iowa, is fall calving, uh, what do I think about fall calving uh, beef cows in uh, northern Iowa? And I said, I think it's a stupid idea. And I'll tell you why. When is the energy highest in the grass? In the summer when it's growing. When is the energy requirement of the cow highest in the winter. Which calves at, at weaning time weigh the most? The fall calvers or the spring calvers? The spring calvers, always. Which one has the, the best chance of having calves get pneumonia? The fall calvers. Do whatever you like. I am going to cabin the spring. <laughs> I turned it off and then I turned it back on. So now it probably won't work at all. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you understand? Uh, uh, uh. There's just, it's just, lo it's, well, there's lots of reasons. <laughs> there's a lot more energy in the summer, and I get, I also have more protein, and I get a faster rate of gain on that calf. I'll, uh, uh, a spring calving uh, uh, cow will have a, a almost a 100-pound heavier calf, unless you're creeping the calf. That's cheating, but you can do that. All right, now we're going to talk about grazing. Ignore the color because the green doesn't show up and it's not very dark and I want people to see these grass plants and, uh, and sun. Good job, right? And, uh, hold on. Too many things in my hand. Water. Oh, well. Green water. Probably had uh, algae in it or something. And what happens here is, I'll get them here in a minute. CO2 that we're going to charge people to take from them out of the big cities are taken up here by the plant. And by the way, it's not a source of energy. You put out fires with it. Water, you put out fires with it. Water is coming up in the plant. Here's my H2O. And with photosynthesis, these electrons coming down and through the process of photosynthesis, this molecule is broken down. The oxygen goes off into the air that we're going to sell to Washington to keep them alive. And this hydrogen is the energy. Remember, 25,000 calories per gram. There it is combines with the CO2 to make sugars, 
first glucose, then it makes uh, uh, more different types of sugars and starches and cellulose and hemicellulose and even lignin and fats and waxes. All of those, all of them are carbohydrates. So, where is the energy highest in this grass plant? Where the sun hits. Does the sun come over here and, uh, no, you know that. Somebody in fifth grade told you they went in a straight line. Well, I think it was fifth grade, I don't remember. It was just a few years ago. All right, so if you ch take a refractometer and you take a top part of the plant, I don't care, third, half, whatever, and you check for sugar levels, this area will have more sugar than this area. You don't have to believe me. You can test it for yourself. Okay, so the energy is going to be highest here. It may also have a lot of protein here. Down here, the nitrogen is mostly nitrate and it's transported by potassium is coming up also with the water. So down here we're going to have lower energy and higher non-protein nitrogen because we don't have the photosynthesis. It's being transported to that site. So the energy to protein ratio is very bad down here but the energy to protein up here is much better. Now, so what's going to give me the best rate of gain? Well, right here, because the energy to protein ratio is better, a lot more energy. So we come along and we graze, and how much do you graze? I don't know. Ask the cow. Do you know how to ask the cow? Here's how you do it. You get your paddock set up. You open the gate, and you stand there and watch. It's really hard to do because nobody does it. I know they don't because they don't, nobody grazes properly. So they go out there, and they watch them, and do they come into that paddock and eat this into the ground and then go over to this one? No. They just take a bite, move it to the next uh, maybe 10 feet, take another bite, and they keep going. Now there'll be some plants in here that they don't eat, okay? Plants that they don't want to eat. And they're the same grass plants as these. Or maybe they're different. So what? Why didn't they eat those? But because for some reason the energy in these plants is not as high as that one. Remember what I told you about the animal's natural instinct, to eat the highest energy parts of the plant that it could eat. Not, nothing more. And if, if, if the animal's health and performance is, is what's paying the bill, don't argue with them. Don't force them to eat this all down here like a perfect carpet. Quit it! Unless you don't care. I don't, doesn't matter to me. It's your money. So if they come down through here and they eat this one and then they move over and they won't eat. I gotta quit this here. There. They won't eat those and they don't want to eat that one. And then they come over here and, and they eat this one right here. Okay, okay, so when you go into that paddock, don't look at a distance out there and say, well, uh, they, they came around in the paddock and now they're back, and what they're going to do is munch this one again and not eat any of these. So what are you going to do? Force them to eat those? Yeah, that's what most people do. Or they clip. You know, they go out there and mow everything so it's perfect level, like their lawn. 
don't do that. Leave it alone. Let him eat this, and then eat this, and then take him out of that paddock, and you've got a whole bunch of stuff they never ate. Does it matter? Why? Because if you put them in in the proper, uh, proper number of animals per acre, some of this is going to get trumped down here on the ground, hopefully. It's called animal impact. And what do you do with animal impact is you knock these plants down and feed the bacteria and the protozoa and all the insects in the soil. And what does that do? Well, it stops sunlight from reaching the ground. It stops water from evaporating. It feeds the bacteria which feed the plant, which grows the plant faster. So we're feeding the animal, the, all the critters down here, which is very desirable. Will you get all of them knocked down? No, some of them will still be up there. Yes, sir. So a mild prevention is, if I take cattle out like that, I'll go through that area Yes, uh, he's talking about the color of the grass change. When you rotate the animals in there, a and uh, you put them in for however long, and then you move them out, the, the grass is uh, probably a lighter green or even a brown color, okay? Uh, and um, why is that? What the animal did is ate the highest energy, highest photosynthesizing plant, which is green, and they left the rest. Now, what had been, been desirable is if a third or a half of that plants that are left standing had been knocked on the ground, eventually you'll start getting more and more green. But it, it takes uh, proper uh, animal impact. And what I mean by animal impact is uh, if I have a a paddock that's big and square. I don't know why everybody has to have a square paddock, but that's the way they do. And if you put, here's the gate right here, and you put the cattle in there, what are they going to do? They're going to spread out all over everything, right? They just spread out. So you don't have much impact, do you? There's not a, a bunch of grass being knocked down because they just spread out everywhere. But if you, there's a downside to what I'm about to tell you. This is easy doing that. But if you put the animals in and make all those animals go in this way, tight tight, tight, and let's say halfway you put a fence here, and so they're just going to, what, trample maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of the grass on the ground and eat 10 or 20 or 30 percent. Oh, that's wasteful. No. These bugs down here need to be fed. They eat the same thing the cow eats. If you want more grass, you feed these guys. If you want less grass, you feed the cows. I'm serious. What is your concentration? So do you have a range? I don't have a range because the reason I don't have a range, I know everybody likes a million pounds the acre, all that horse manure, but that depends on that particular pasture and what size of animal and and how often are you going to move them oh i have a phone call oh uh, i gotta take uh, the kids to the day i don't know you know what happens that's the way farming is yes sir
What else does the, uh, the, the question, uh, thank you. <laughs> the question is, is his calves like to browse, to eat bushes and, and tree leaves and stuff? And is that part of uh, their requirement or why do they do that more so, th more so than what the cows do? Well, what do the calves get to eat? Milk. Milk on a dry matter basis is 32% protein. What do you think that they could be doing? Diluting their ration. Also, it's very low in oxygen. They're balancing their ra ration. They're chemists. Unbelievable. That's what they're doing. That's why having a forest is a really good thing. Also for the cows. Cows can worm themselves if you have the right trees. Probably didn't know that. I know it. Okay. So. Walnut. Okay. No, 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 don't follow one with another. That's, don't do that. You put them all in one bunch. If you separate and, st oh, that's, no, don't ever do that. Don't, unless you, in, no. There's too many bad things are happening. S whoever goes in first is going to get the highest energy. They're going to do the best. The next one behind are going to get a little worse. And the next one behind are going to get a little worse. And your pasture will get more thistle and uh, won't be as fun to look at. Okay? okay. <laughs> All right. Now, there's a, there's a downside to doing this, grazing this way. And the downside is, is it takes time a lot of time you're get, you know depending on how much you want to increase the production of the of the pasture to where you want instead of uh, on beef cows we talk about three acres to the cow to feed it for a year if you want to get it where it's three cows to the acre you have to do this you have to increase the forage production. To increase the forage production, you have to use an animal to knock some of this plant material down to feed the bacteria and protozoa in the soil. That's the trick. But nobody does, nobody believes me. You feed these guys, they'll feed this, and you'll have lots of grass. Lots and lots of grass. But the problem is, is we have to put them in here and move them and move them maybe in here 20 minutes and then you're moving them again. Depending on the pasture, it may be 20 minutes or it may be a half hour. Well, let's say you want to go to, you know, you want to go to church and, and you're going to be gone the whole day. Okay. Give them the whole pasture. Well, big deal. At least you know what it takes. Now, a mistake that many people do is they have this pasture and the, the cows come in here and they eat this and they don't eat some of these and they eat this. And maybe they're different species. Uh, all the best one is uh, cockleburr. That's a really good one. Because you'll look out over that pasture and you'll see green. Oh, that's, you know, what you, sh and, and uh, you see the green and the grass plants that they do like. Look like that. You know, but, you know, you look out there and you saw, well, I got all this green, you know, there's plenty to eat, you know. But why do I keep getting more and more cockleburr? Because you let the ground open for the cockleburr to grow. And you didn't put any green material down on the ground to feed the bacteria. It takes green 
plant material to grow a culture of bacteria. If you want more cockleburr, you want fungus. So you allow dry dead material, you know, old cockleburrs to fall down. Then you get more fungus and, and not much bacteria and you get a whole bunch of woody plants and not the grass that you want. So, when you put an animal in there and they come along and they eat, a p eat the desirable grass plant, even though you've got a whole bunch of cockleburrs in there, you watch the plants that they're eating and move them. You'll say, I'm going to run out of pasture. Yeah, the f first year you might. What you should have done is reduced your herd until you get to the point where you need to increase it because it will happen. Uh, oh, all right. Yes, sir. I understand. What can I do to get there? Okay. He's running about 100,000 pounds per acre, uh, uh, moving them uh, uh, twice a day. Twice a day, right? And, and his sugar bricks are six to eight. It's quite low, okay? And wants to know what to do to get that sugar bricks up. All right. This is real easy. Feed these guys. Knock a bunch of that grass down on the ground when it's green. That's number one. If you can't do that, take some hay out. Feed them on the ground, feed the cows on the ground with some hay, if you don't mind that. Or haylage, I don't care. Feed these guys. Next. When you are grazing, I don't care how many pounds per acre, make sure that they only, the ones that they do eat is only the top half, third, I don't care. And make sure they knock some more of this down and move them. And then let this grass plant recover. Once you let this plant, see what happens when you, when you graze off, some of the roots, some of the sap in the roots are taken up to replace this, okay? So you must have it grown back to the same height so that you can replenish the roots. Otherwise, they continue to get shorter and shorter. But before you come back and graze again, you must let this get just a little bit taller. Take your yardstick out and measure it. Yes? No, oh, I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> it's not for. Oh, it is. All right.